Well, thank you very much for, uh, for coming. I'm glad I have such a big audience here. So, long title, I'm a geneticist, and what I hope to convince you is that genes are important, but maybe we overestimate what they can, because uh, one of the interesting things is whenever I talk to uh, other people who are not scientists, they're like, oh, if you do genes involved in in things like criminal behavior or impulsive behavior, what are we going to do when, the, when we find genes involved in this? So I hope to convince you that even though that may be true that genes are involved in a lot of behaviors, they are not everything and they, can, they are not unmodifiable. So what is influencing my work are two revolutions. The first one is the Human Genome Project. And I think I will try to do it the way everyone is doing is coming closer to you. So over the past 15 or 20 years or so, the human genome has been deciphered and also the genomes of many other model organisms. And so it's relatively easy now to look at people's DNA. I can take your DNA and pay a few thousand dollars and sequence the whole uh, DNA and find out what differences there are. And if you take two people, there are about three million differences between each of you. So there are lots of differences between people. And the other part is, as we know, this is the century of the brain. And so we would like to use the DNA to help us understand all kinds of properties on, of the brain, including you know, personalities, behaviors, uh, and also problems like addictions and depression. So the, the research of my lab goes about understanding the differences between people. Does that, why are some people more likely to get addicted? Why are some people more likely to get depressed? Is this influenced by your parents? Is it influenced by you yourself? What can you do? And how much, how does that interact with your genetic differences? So the uh, title of the Conti Center, unbeknownst to me, was Nature and Nurture Remodeled. I didn't even know this, but that was, very close to the title that I chose anyway. So what I want to do is hopefully explain to you how the two things go together. So where does the word nature and nurture come from? Nurture means nutrition. You see here a somewhat overweight female. You probably recognize who this is. <laughs> and she eats relatively healthy. She eats salad. She exercises four or five times a week and has a decent cholesterol, but eh, now, yeah, not too, not too great, not too bad. Neither gained nor, uh, nor lost weight in the past few years. But I know, if I ate as much as I wanted and I didn't exercise, it would not be good. So I know I can barely manipulate my environment. Here's my husband. He is skinny, <laughs> underweight. He eats a ton. He never exercises. He actually tries to gain weight and can't. And his cholesterol is like off scale low. It's like a, a under 120, which I've never heard, total cholesterol. I've never heard of anyone having this low. So what is this? What is going on? Is this environment or is this genes or is this both of them? And why are there these differences? Well, I think my problem is the problem that Jim Neal, the founder of the Michigan Human Genetics Department coined about 20, 30 years ago, the thrifty gene hypothesis. What that means is if there's very little food, then if you can use every calorie you eat really well, you are the one to survive in a famine. So that's good for you. It's a thrifty gene that's good for you, and the people who have that property live the longest. And nowadays, that same trait, that same thrifty gene, when there is plenty of food, and plenty of temptations to eat leads to obesity, high cholesterol, and diabetes. And some people, for example, uh, Native Americans, certain tribes of Native Americans have a very, very high incidence of this. They were probably selected for, in, uh, for this thrifty gene because they were in evolution under a lot of pressure to, in, in of famines where they couldn't eat. So the th same thrifty genes in another environment makes you survive less well. And so this is one of those 
uh, uh, problems that we also we want to talk about today, which is the same gene can be advantageous in one environment and disadvantageous in another environment. There's actually an animal model. We've talked a lot about animal models today, and I'm not talking much about it. But there is an Israeli sand rat that lives in the desert where there isn't much food. And it's fine in the desert. But as soon as you put it into a laboratory where it can has free access to food, it gets very obese and diabetic and dies much earlier. So this is where this idea of nature nurture comes from. And even though I wasn't going to talk about that much, the differences between people who are more likely to get obese or not that people have found genetically so far are mostly differences in brain hormones and brain effects and not so much what your fat cells or your insulin are doing. So it, a lot of that also goes back to the brain, even though you might not think this is a brain effect. OK, so this is called gene-environment interaction, when we have the effect of a gene in one environment being different than in another. And uh, now what I want to do is talk a about a few examples from my field where we have these kind of gene-environment interactions. And the first one, I think, is one where I would like you to listen and tell me if you can tell me what, uh, what tones you hear. Yeah, it's a piano. Can someone tell me what tones there are? What note? C, G, wow. So, that's an interesting one. Can someone, C, G was actually correct, but I, does anyone know how, how it went further? That's an interesting one. I had not expected so many to know this. Wow, yep. So, so it, it, it's correct, C, G, B, flat, D, wow. So uh, can anyone say what, the, what interval the first one is? It's a fifth, okay, well, I don't need to make fifths, fine. So what the, the ability to say that it's, I don't know whether the person who said C, G was guessing or was really sure, but this is usually, in, in this ability in among Americans is rare, but among sort of educated Americans is a little bit uh, more common. So this ability to be able to say it's C rather than A or G is called an absolute or perfect pitch. And very few people in Europe and in the US can actually do that, and those who can are called, uh, are said to have a perfect pitch. And Everyone who can, now the ones who said CG, did you, when did you learn anything about music? What age were you? Seven, okay. So studies have shown that pretty much everyone who has that ability has had early music education. Who here has had early music education? Quite a few people. So, Many with this absolute pitch have had early music education, but there are many, many people who have early music education who may be able to say it's a fifth, but who would have no idea whether it started with C or A or B. So most people with early music education don't have absolute pitch. But if you have it, you have always had this. And people with a perfect pitch often also have a relative who has that too which indicates that maybe there is a genetic effect to it. Uh, so most people cannot tell which note it is, but many more of those people who have had the early music education can say the relative difference, the fact that it's a fifth. So this is what is a, the kind of diagram I will show you several times in various other contexts, so let's go through it for a moment. So here we have what we're looking at, so whether or not you have perfect pitch, no or yes. And here's an environmental factor, in this case, early music education, no early music education, yes. And in this audience, obviously, it was most people were on this side and only some people on this side. But the people who have perfect pitch 
all have early music education. So this is how gene-environment interaction typically looks like. And usually there's nobody in the literature that has this perfect pitch but didn't have music education. Okay, so are there gene-environment interactions like that where music education interacts with genes to bring perfect pitch also involved in all kinds of human behaviors? So one of the behaviors that we're talking about is depression. There are a lot of people, something like about 10 to 15 percent of people who suffer from depression. Most people have experienced a neighbor or friend or relative with it, where people get into an anxious, sad, hopeless mood, often having eating and sleeping disturbances. Nearly always, the first episode of depression is triggered by either a stressful period in your life in general or a stressful life event, something like a loved one dying, as we just heard, is very, very stressful. Your risk when you have that happening, like a loved one dying, to get, to get depression is very much increased if you have a family history of depression, which means there is a genetic factor involved. Some genes make people more likely, and some people are sad, but resilient and won't get depressed. So, a former student of mine who is now a faculty member, Sri Jin Shen, studied this in a very interesting example. It's nearly like studying uh, guinea pigs. It is taking a medical doctor. Is there anyone who, who here who is a medical doctor? Other Dr. Alada is. Anyone else? Uh, no, nobody else. So in, the, in, a, uh, in a budding phys physician's life, one of the most stressful periods is the first year of residency, also called internship. And so what he does is he recruits these people right when they are matched and know in which uh, university they are going. And then they ask them to answer questions about their mood that result in a kind of depression score over the next year. And what he finds is staggering. So when they start before their internship, about 4% fulfill criteria of having depression. Over the next three months, a total of about 40% of them at various times in this year fulfill criteria for depression. So at any one time, it's, it's about a quarter of them. So these people are under so much stress they have more than 24-hour shifts. We just heard already about how bad that is for your performance. They uh, have to make medical decisions for people when they feel like they are not prepared for it. It's a very, very stressful event. So do we know anything about genes making a difference when, you know, 40% of people get more at, at various times depressed, but the other 60% aren't? Do we know anything about the genes? Well, we can test that. And so the way we test this is we actually don't even need a blood sample. We just get collect a little bit of spit, extract the DNA from it. And then what we looked at is the gene that is the target of antidepressants like Prozac. So if you look for a gene involved in depression, you might want to look at a gene that uh, in, interacts with an antidepressant. And this gene, uh, Larry just actually talked about the regions of a gene that are uh, influencing whether or not a gene is used a lot or a little, the promoter region. And so there is a low and a high activity form, which is short or long, or S or L. And so we looked at that in these same MDs. And what we see is that, first of all, you see a different graph. You see uh, here a score for depression. And what you see, first of all, that all under low stress are much lower than under high stress what we just saw earlier. Most people are under less depressed uh, conditions when they are under low stress. But what you see here also is the high activity form has less of a risk than the people who have the low activity form of that particular gene. So in this particular case, we see, and we see no difference before the stress is there. So to see the effect of the gene on depression, we need to test the people under stress. This is not really a depression gene. It's a gene that's making you more or less responsive to this stressful event. Only in the stressful conditions do you play, does the gene effect play out. 
Okay, so there um, is another known effect involved in depression, which is if you were separated at birth a lot, if you had a lot of caregiver changes, if you were abused as a child. And we talked a little bit about this throughout the day. So if we look at that situation, can we see the effect of this gene? Well, I, I wouldn't ask you if, if we don't see it. So here you have the probability of having depression shown with no maltreatment when you're not treated, maltreated as a child. If you are maybe maltreated, and maltreatment in, involves abuse, but it also uh, involves caregiver changes and severe maltreatment. And the same uh, short, long, or low, high activity form of the serotonin transporter has an effect there with the short or low activity form increasing your risk to depression, whereas if you have this, uh, the long form, there's no difference. It doesn't matter. So you're resilient against this problem of this environmental effect of the, of the child abuse, but most people have no child abuse or maltreatment, and there's no difference of this gene. So again, you see the effect of the gene in one environment, in this case, whether or not you had child abuse, but not in other environments. So what we talked about so far is that being abused, having risk, gene, uh, risk genes, having life events, having high chronic stress, like during residency, all increases your risk for depression. That's something we can do to change it. Well, what I want you to do now is close your eyes and just meditate for a moment. And the, of the instructions, I'm not a meditation instructor, but the, uh, what you want to do is you want to breathe carefully, slowly through your nose and concentrate on feeling the, the air coming out of your nose right over your lips. And when you do that a few times, thoughts will come to your mind. You will just notice them and register and then try to go back to your concentration on the breathing. eyes. So what have we done? Actually, research says if we do this a lot, we can actually change our genes. Well, the title is not exactly. I would not completely agree with this. This is the title that they had in the newspaper article about it. What we are changing is the expression of our genes or how our genes are read. So what a study that just came out, and there are many other studies with similar results has shown, is if you meditate, you can show that certain genes are read more in your blood, in, in your cells, and other genes are read less. So you're actually changing not the genes raw material, not the plan, but how the plan of the genes is executed. So yoga, meditation, can actually induce changes at the genetic level. Well, guess what? It can also change things in your brain. So this is actually uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Wisconsin, in a, near Scanner. He and a whole bunch of monks that have done meditation for more than 10,000 hours, that do this like daily for several hours, have been looked at in a scanner by uh, 
several people, mostly it's Richard Davidson who was involved in this. And they have looked and said, what is the difference? And what they find is they look at the brain and they look where it gets activated when certain things happen. And what they find is that uh, meditators in the, uh, will have uh, more activate activity in the part of the brain where they're concentrating on things. So I was asking you to concentrate on sort of looking at yourself, at your thoughts coming in. And so that part is more active and other parts of the brain that have to do with sort of distracting thoughts or things where they are, are less active. And there's a lot more about this. So this is just one example that uh, is, is on the web. But overall, you can actually show that not only can you change how your genes are read, you also can change your brain permanently by doing things like meditation. In fact, there are a couple of other things you can do, which I'm not going to talk about. So exercise is a natural antidepressant. And in fact, exercise activates one particular substance called brain-derived neurogrowth factor, which is activated also by antidepressants. So it's exactly the same molecule that can be activated by, by exercise as is done by antidepressants. So uh, nutrition, there are also nutritional things that can be done. And so overall, the way we think about depression is there are genetic vulnerabilities. They affect how anxious you are, your personality. It may affect your, how your hormones work. We know that there are early experiences like stress or child abuse that affect your risk for depression. And when you are then vulnerable, then life stresses, daily stresses, like what we talked about, the residency, life events can actually trigger you getting into depression. But things like exercise, good nutrition, and meditation can be prevented. So the genes are not causing depression. They are increasing or decreasing risk. But there are a lot of environmental factors that can be used to modify their effect. OK. Another area that we are very interested in researching is alcoholism. One of the things that we know already, not from genetics, but from many other studies, is that if you are very impulsive, if you are someone who really likes to try something new and gets excited very easily, that that increases your risk of alcoholism. So we are also looking at impulsive behavior. And other people uh, have also looked at that in terms of criminal behavior. So how, how does that work? How can we explain this and can we identify genes involved? And so we do this in a study called the Michigan Longitudinal Study. And what we did is over 25 years ago, uh, the fathers that were uh, males that had a drunk driving conviction were recruited and were asked, do they have a three to five year old son living at home? And if yes, if they are interested in the study. And so they were recruited over 25 years ago and were visited for several hours every few years, the, both the parents and the children. These children, as you can do the math, are now in their uh, mid-20s. And so they have started to drink themselves. And so what we want to know is, is what is the effect of environment, of genes, of lots of things about how these at-risk children develop and what makes some uh, more likely to become addicted versus others. So we also looked at other families in the same neighborhood. And in the last couple of years, we've looked in these families uh, and asked for DNA for genetic studies. And as you'll hear in a moment, we also put them in a scanner and asked them to do certain things in the scanner to look at their, uh, their, those effects. And so. This is probably the busiest slide, so hopefully we, we don't have to uh, spend too much time on it. So the pathway that we are investigating is from genes to the brain to behavior to alcohol use in this case. And the gene that we are looking at uh, that I want to tell you about is called GABA-A2. It's actually part of the uh, pathway of when you take benzodiazepines, like Valium it acts on this particular molecule. So when we look at this, what we asked is, 
can we, the, the, there, there is a link between this gene and alcoholism that was identified more than 10 years ago by a different group. And so what we asked is, can we figure out what behavior mediates this effect of this gene on alcohol? And can we find a specific brain region that affects this? So I told you already that being impulsive, exciting, is part of this. And so this is our hypothesis in this case. Can impulsivity be involved? And indeed, we, we identified impulsivity as one of the mediators of the effect of GABRA on alcoholism. So we know now that this particular gene has an uh, effect on alcoholism because a variant in this gene increases our, our impulsivity. So to look at where in the brain it might act, we put people into a scanner and we uh, looked at how their brain gets activated in certain tasks. And one of the tasks is one where, the, where, the, where in, when you're in the scanner, it tells you, OK, now comes a round where you might lose money, or you might gain money, or there's no money at stake. And people actually, regions, parts of the regions of the brain light up when you anticipate that you might win $5. And they actually physically will get this money. So they know that they will get the money. It's not fake money. And everyone has a certain area of the brain that lights up in these kind of reward anticipation tasks. And this area is called the insula. And what we found is that how much the insula uh, lights up has to do with the genetics of this GABA variant. So the variation in this GABA gene changes how much you, it lights up. If you have a GG, you light up more. And if you have an AA, you light less. And how much this area of the brain lights up also has to do with you, how impulsive you are when you are filling out a questionnaire that asks you, oh, I really like to get excited, or I much prefer being sort of uh, even leveled mood. So what we can say is that this variant is associated with alcoholism through its effect on impulsivity and through a part of the brain called the insula that's involved with anticipating a reward. So can this be modified? Well, it turns out that parenting can modify this. And this is called, in science, parental monitoring, but I think all of us know what this means. If parents who ask the kids, where are you going? Who is with you? When are you going to go back? And who know who they are with and where they are. They are parents who are considered high parental monitoring. The people who, the parents who, are not, who don't do that behavior actually are known, increase the probability to be in this bad trajectory, to be in this increasing trajectory. The last example I want to talk about is a very controversial one, and I hope we can talk about that a little bit. About 10 years ago, people found a gene, a variant in a gene called MAOA and found that it increased the risk of criminal activity and the risk of impulsive behavior. And if you knock this gene out completely in a mouse, the mice become very, very aggressive. So it can actually be reproduced. Now, this, so the effect of this gene was only seen in children who were, in people, not children, in adults who as children were maltreated. Now, that fact that maltreatment affects your risk of being in a, in a, having a, committing crimes or being, uh, engaging in criminal behavior was known for a long time. I think most of us have heard about that, that if kids were uh, beaten up, maltreated, abused as children, they are more likely to be in trouble later. And that is modified by this gene. So what you can see here is, the people who are black, the, the black bars, show the, the children, the adults who as children were maltreated, and they are much higher than the white bars, which are the people who were not maltreated. But the genotype, the high or low MAOA activity, affects this. And so this is another graph very similar to all the ones that we've saw, shown so far, 
So if you have the low MAOA activity, you're more likely to have this antisocial or impulsive behavior than if you have the high MAOA activity. Now, this particular gene, because it was when it was found 10 years ago, has actually been used in courts to try to say, well, people always knew that if you were maltreated as a child, you are more likely to engage in criminal activity. But if you talk to a lawyer who defends such a, a criminal case, they say, ah, there's always someone in the jury who says, yeah, but I was also beaten up as a child, and I'm not committing murders. This doesn't count. And so the argument that is being made is, well, some of these make your gene, some genes may make you more resilient against that kind of treatment, and other uh, other genes may make you more sensitive to this kind of treatment. So there have been a lot of trials, about a dozen or so, in the past couple of years. And these are just newspaper and internet articles about mostly this particular gene's finding, but also some brain scans that people are using. So we talked a little bit about what that means. So you have genetic variation that makes some people more at risk and some people less at risk. But does that mean that that excuse criminal behavior, for example? Does that mean we, are, we, we can use this as an excuse? I think no, because what we talked about is we can also modify our own behavior. And we can stop the genes from having the effect by what we are doing. So to summarize what I hopefully talked, uh, got across today, is genes have everything to do with behavior. There are genes involved in any behavior that you can possibly think of. There are genes involved. And if there are differences between people in alcohol use, in depression, in feeling happy, in being able to tell a musical tone, in being excited about winning or losing in a game, all of that is affected to some extent by genes. And a lot of the differences that we have between people are, uh, to some extent, uh, in, uh, affected by genes. On the other hand, these genes don't act on their own. A lot of the genes affect effects on other genes, and most of these genes we don't know. So if you hear about a new gene, as long as we don't know the other interacting genes, we often don't know enough to really use this predictively. Many of these ge genetic effects have a different effect depending on the environment. So in some environment, the same gene may be useful, and in other environments, it may not be useful. So it may be that you, instead of looking at the genes as deterministic as, oh, I have the gene for so-and-so, therefore I can drink, I can't help, this is my fate, you can actually do something about the environment and say, well, I have this gene, so I need to do certain precautions to not see this gene's effect. And in the case of depression and alcoholism, we know a little bit about that. So for most behaviors, the environment has a strong effect, and the environment interacts with the genes. And we have, um, when, when the last point here is one that uh, we might want to talk about a little bit. Because when, whenever we sort of behavioral geneticists talk to people about the fact that there may be genes involved in how impulsive you are in things like alcoholism or criminal behavior, they say, well, if it's in the genes, then we can't do anything about it. This is a dangerous proposition, where is free will? But the fact is, we've known for 20 years, for 50 years, that bad abuse also makes you more likely to, be, to engage in certain behaviors. We have no control about that either, right? We have our gene as our burden, but we also have our childhood environment as burden. And so both of them are things we have to live with and have to move on uh, and change the environment now. So the third, what, uh, I don't know why it skipped. I must have pressed one. I must have okay, pressed a button I wasn't supposed to do. Well, the third point is, even though there are historic environmental factors, such as child abuse, there are also current environmental factors that can modify the effects. So 
even though we think of genes as being permanent and deterministic, you can see that something like meditation can change how your genes are expressed. And there are many other, hmm? okay, doesn't matter. I think I'm, uh, this says, stop talking, don't worry, don't worry about it. So I think I should stop here and say thank you for your attention. Thank you.